Let's, let's pray, beloved, as we get into God's Word this morning. Father, how good it is, Lord, again, just to know that as we sit at your feet, Lord, you are here to open your heart up to us. And so, Lord, may our hearts be completely open to you and what you have to say to us. And so, Lord, as your children, as your servants, we say, speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I want you to think about if you've ever had a, a VIP ever show up at your house. If it's ever been announced that you've got someone important coming to, to have dinner with you. Kind of what happens to your attitude? Do you get into a tense mode? Does, uh, does your house get kind of stressed? Everything going on. Everything has to be perfect. You know, uh, all the clothes picked up. Uh, dusting happening, um, you know, you don't want to hear a kid crying or yelling, you know, everything just has to be perfect. Is, is that kind of the mode of your home? A VIP, something, just, someone just really important coming. I just want to, us to think about if that very important person was God. What if it was announced to you, someone came and said, God is going to show up in three days. In three days, You've got three days to prepare yourself. What would be your mode? Would you still go to work? What would you do? I mean, if someone is coming to your house that is important, you know, don't you get your best dress or your best suit out? You, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't allow them to come to your home with you wearing your, your short and t-shirts, right? You know? And, and with the TV cranked up, would that be something that you would do? No. No. Your suit, tie, your, your best sorry out. You want to make an impression. But if it was God, what would we do? The Israelites had something very similar happen to them. It was announced to them that God was going to show. I want you to turn with me real quick to Exodus chapter 19. Exodus chapter 19. Beloved, they had known the hand of God. The, the people of Israel had, had seen God move on their behalf. Right. They've seen the plagues. That they knew that the plagues were sent by God. They, they knew that it was God's hand that, that parted the Red Sea. But this was different. Th these were signs. These were wonders. But then God was announcing. He says, I'm coming to my people. It's not just... I'm going to show them signs and wonders. My presence, I'm going to visit them. There's going to be a visitation by my presence. And in verse 10, in verse 10 in chapter 19, it says this, The Lord also said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their garments and let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. You shall set bounds for the people all around, saying, Beware that you do not go up on the mountain or touch the border of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. No hand shall touch him, but he shall surely be stoned or shot through. Whether beast or man, he shall not live. When the ram's horn sounds a long blast, they shall come up to the mountain. They shall come up to the mountain. This, beloved, there, there was, it, it wasn't where the people were thinking, okay, what do we need to do to prepare ourselves for God's visitation? It wasn't that. It was where God was telling Moses, listen, I'm telling you what to do to prepare for my visitation. You don't have to worry about trying to figure it out. I'm letting you know. And the first thing that I'm calling you to do is consecrate yourself. Set yourself apart. How? Wash your garments. Now remember, they have been slaves for over 400 years. Their garments probably aren't the best. Their garments are quite dirty probably being in the, 
in the desert, in the wilderness. And yet, God is saying, wash your garments. It's, it's important that you wash your garments because it's important that you understand, begin to understand who is coming to visit you. It's the one who is holy. It is the one who is righteous. It is the one who is all-powerful who did part the Red Sea. Recognize that. So wash your garments. And you've got two days, you've got three days to do it. So get started. Second is this. He says in verse 12, You shall set bounds for the people all around, saying, Beware that you do not go up on the mountain. So what the Lord was saying is, I'm setting boundaries for you. Boundaries, beloved, are important. Boundaries are, are meant to protect, aren't they? I, I believe that we have probably some IIT students. Uh, some of y'all students, y'all know that a few a couple of weeks ago, I think Vice President Biden from the U.S. came to visit Mumbai and actually was in IIT. So you kind of understand this sense of boundaries because as I understand it, IIT was almost in a lockdown mode. When Vice President Biden came in to the campus, there were Secret Service agents everywhere. So some of the students couldn't even get out of their class. But the whole thing about that visit was to protect Vice President Biden. The thing what God is doing here is, I'm setting boundaries around this mountain to protect you. He's saying, I don't need protection. You need protection. Don't even go to the mountain. I'm going to visit. And there's going to be a visitation, but, but don't go near the mountain. And, and you know what? When we hear something like that, don't we want to kind of press it? We want to say, okay, I can't go up the mountain, but can, can I touch it? Can I just touch it? Like, you know, children, we love to press our boundaries. And yet God had this cover. He said, don't even touch the mountain. Because when you do, you will surely die. You will be stoned to death. I want you to, he was saying, I want you to understand the seriousness of this visitation. And then they did all that they did. They consecrated themselves. They set the boundaries. And then he also says this in verse 15. He says, he said to the people, be ready for the third day. And then he says this, do not go near a woman. Do not go near, what, what does he mean by that? Just very simply for all of us, don't get distracted. Don't get distracted because the one who is the creator of all is coming and his presence is going to be there. Don't allow anything to distract you from him. We get so easily distracted. Beloved, I, I believe that any time, even when we gather in worship, do we not get distracted? I, I mean, I know, I know for a fact that there are times when we stand up here and, and we're preaching that we've got a little pet lizard that comes out ever so often. Yeah, y'all you, you know that pet lizard, right? And every time he comes out, I can see your eyes. And your eyes come off of me and they go straight to the lizard. And I know, though, that the Word of God then, there's a distraction that is coming in. And that little pet lizard is no longer a pet. It's a hindrance. Because the Word of God is life. The Word of God brings hope. And yet the enemy tries to steal that Word from us in whatever ways that he can. And so he's saying to the people of Israel, do not get distracted. On that third day, don't miss my visitation. Don't miss my visitation. Today, don't miss my visitation. Don't miss my presence. And then the third day comes. I want you to get this. It says in verse 16, So it came about on the third day when it was morning, that there was thunder and lightning flashes and a thick cloud of and a thick cloud upon the mountain and a very loud trumpet sound so that all the people who were in the camp they trembled and Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God and they stood at the foot of the mountain now Mount Sinai was all in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire and its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace and the whole mountain quaked violently. When the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him 
with thunder. I want you to get this, beloved. There are three things Israel saw. When they stood at that mountain on the third day, they saw the mountain on fire. So they were looking with their eyes, and what they were beholding was something that was very different than they had never seen, and it was the mountain on fire. Moses saw a bush on fire. They saw a mountain on fire. They felt the ground underneath them quaked. Beloved, when the presence of God comes, the ground doesn't stay still. Things start shaking, beloved, when the presence of God descends. They felt the ground underneath them. Wouldn't that be unnerving? They saw, they felt, and then they heard. What were they hearing? It says the trumpets were sounding. Now they, they knew the, the trumpet of a ram's horn, but this was a different trumpet that they were hearing. This was something that grew louder and louder and louder. Usually when a trumpet sounds, the person who is, who is breathing into that instrument, they will run out of breath. But this trumpet was continuing to get louder and louder and louder. Beloved, it says that all three of the, their senses were being used. They, they saw, they felt, they heard, and it created something very fearful within them. They became terrified of it because the God, the, the moral lawgiver, had descended, beloved. How terrifying that would be, beloved. And yet, when you look at chapter 20, we get the Ten Commandments out of this. That when God visited, He gave the law. That when He came, when the trumpets were sounding and the, and the ground was quaking, and the mountain was on fire, He spoke and gave the Ten Commandments. He gave the law. He spoke and gave the law. And yet, hear me, beloved. What was the result? Go with me to verse 18, chapter 20, verse 18. Underline this, verse 18 and 19. It says, All the people perceived the thunder and the lightning flashes and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood at a distance. And in verse 19, Then they said to Moses, Speak to us yourself, and we will listen. But let not God speak to us, or we will die. We've gathered here this morning to hear the Word of God, right? They gathered, and when they heard the Word of God, they said, We don't want to hear it anymore. This is too much of an awesome ordeal that is taking place. We want to run and hide. And I'm wondering, beloved, that they had, they had two days to consecrate themselves, three days to wash their garments. What's going on? Because you know what? After two days or three days of washing your garments, would you not feel confident as, as hosting the visitor? Would you not feel secure? You've consecrated yourself. You washed. You, you look like the bride. Right? You've got your best clothes out. So what's happening with their confidence? It's almost like they've done everything that God commanded and yet their confidence has just been broken. You know, when, when I was... When I was a teenager, I played a lot of tennis. I loved tennis. I, I practiced tennis. I would, I would hit a ball against my garage wall for hours, and I'd play some, in some tournaments and stuff. But you know what? And I would feel pretty confident when I got on the tennis court. But then I, I would come against a guy that was bigger, that was stronger, and who could place the ball a little bit better. And my confidence would quickly come down. And beloved, they had, they had known a lot of things. They, they, had, they had probably known Pharaoh and they, they had known taskmasters, but they had never seen anything like this before. And they had never heard anything like this. And it was almost like, beloved, what they were feeling was not the, the outward. The outward then was like, you know what? We're being exposed inwardly because the law was being given. And here's what happens. When, when, when the law is given, Inside, we come undone. 
because we recognize that however we may look outwardly and however we may look the part of a Christian or whatever, but inwardly when the law is coming at us, we recognize that our good is not good enough. We recognize that our purity is not pure enough before the moral lawgiver. And they said, we can't hear this anymore. We're better off. Moses, you speak to us. You hear from God. We're, we're okay with that. And so, beloved, it got, it got to the place where they said, you know what? We don't want to hear this word anymore. We don't want to have this kind of visitation anymore. We're just comfortable with having the word spoken to us from Moses. And I wonder, beloved, is, is sometimes in our own life, or are we just content with hearing the word of God spoke to us from someone else instead of having God speak to us directly? Have you ever just sat in your home and said, God, show up. God, I, I want you to come. Have you ever just sat there and asked for that visitation from God? I think I shared this probably a few years back. My grandmother did that when she was about 85 years old. She grew up in church, but she had been hearing my, my uncle talk about the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit just interacts with us. And she, I remember her saying that one night she got her Bible out and said, God, I want you to show up. And she said as soon as she prayed that prayer, she became overwhelmed with His presence. She said, enough, enough, that's enough. She got scared. She was like, oh, I've never experienced this before. The people of Israel had never experienced anything like this. Because it's a terrifying thing to have the law given to you and recognize the standard of God is not your standard. And your standard can never reach His. Beloved, I want you to turn with me now to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 12. What do we do when God wants to come to us? We have to recognize our place. Now, now, beloved, this word so far may be a heavy word. You feel the heaviness? Okay. But I want you to, I want you to hear this. In verse 18, it says this. In, in chapter 12, verse 18, it says this. To those who are in Christ Jesus, to those who have been bought by the, by the blood of Christ, those who have been atoned for. This word is for you. It, it says this, for you and me, it says, For you have not come to a mountain that can be touched, and to a blazing fire, and to darkness and gloom and whirlwind, and to the blast of a trumpet, and the sound of words which sound was such that those who heard begged that no further word be spoken to them. For they could not bear the command if even a beast touches the mountain, it will be stoned. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I am full of fear and trembling. The truth, beloved, is to the saints of God, to, to those who are in Christ Jesus, the Lord says to you today, you haven't come to that mountain. The Israelites knew that mountain. They knew that kind of fear and trembling. But to those who are in Christ Jesus, this is a good day, beloved. We don't realize how good we have it. He says this in verse 22. But you have come, underline this, but you have come to Mount Zion. You haven't come to Mount Sinai, but you have come to Mount Zion. Now my, Mount Sinai was the mountain that could be seen and it was on fire. The trumpets could be heard, right? You could see, you could hear. The senses were being used. Mount Zion, Mount Zion is different. It's what we can't see. But it's as real as the chairs you're sitting on today and you're trusting in to hold you. Mount Zion as real as anything is, beloved. And he says to all the saints 
you have come to Mount Zion. It, it, it's not, this, this word isn't to you today, you will come. It's not, a, it's not a future. You know what, when you die, you will go to Mount Zion. You know, when you die, you, you'll go to heaven. It's not that kind of word. This is actually in the perfect tense. It says, you have come, which means there has been something done in the past that has a now word for you today in the present. Which means there's this thin veil between the physical realm and the spiritual realm. And we can't see into the spiritual realm. But the Lord says to all who are in Christ Jesus, you now are there. You have arrived. You've arrived at Mount Zion. We can't see it. We can't feel it. We can't even hear it. But the Word of God says to you and me today, we have come. And, and that's a word either today, there, there's a struggle because I can even see it in your faces. Today, it's a day, do I, do I trust this word? Is it true? Because that word can't be true because I wouldn't be having all of these problems. I wouldn't be suffering the way that I'm suffering. I wouldn't have these hardships and, and these struggles. How could I be in Mount Zion? And yet Christ says, it's true. You have come to Mount Zion. It says, and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, myriads of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. Beloved, you have come. You have arrived. You just can't see it. And that's where many times, beloved, we want Mount Sinai, don't we? And yet Mount Sinai, the Israelites understood something. That under the law, and in that place at Mount Sinai, if they saw God, they would die. There was a, there's a holiness to God that many times we don't get. Because we, we're used to hearing about the love of God and the peace of God, but the holiness of God many times doesn't grip us the way that, that it did the Israelites. They understood that day the holiness of God. That, that, they're, that, that them setting themselves apart by washing their garments wasn't good enough. Beloved, I don't know if we understand that in, on the other side of the cross. And yet the truth is, we've got to understand the holiness of God, but also we have to understand and receive where we are today. We have arrived at Mount Zion. You know, it says a city of the living God. I, I love that word because a city is full of people. And you know what? I grew up in a small town. I grew up in a small town. And I loved my, my childhood years. You know, grew up in a town of 3,800. That's small. I understand that. That's very small. But you know what? I enjoy living in Mumbai. I love living in Mumbai. Now, I'm not talking about the roads right now and the potholes. But I enjoy the city because it's the people. And, and yet the Lord says, you have come to the city of God. Now, in, 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 a, in a city, many times we have, you, you go through and there's the upper class, there's the middle, there's the lower, and then there's the slums. But yet, beloved, with the city of God, there is none of that. And yet many times we try to figure out where we belong, don't we? Where do I belong in, in the kingdom? Because our mindset isn't right. And yet the Lord says, you know what? In this place that we dwell in, that we can't see but we're there, we've arrived, it says that there's myriad of angels. It means thousands of angels. And, and beloved, angels have been created for roles. There are some angels that are created just simply to worship God. They're the seraphim and cherubim. They're before God. They're worshiping. Oh, and they're singing. They're saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Worthy is His name. But there's also angels that, that are messengers. They're, they're sent by God to deliver messages from God. Gabriel was a messenger. And, but then there's also the, the angels that are there to fight and to war.
Michael was a, is a warrior angel. I want you to just jump with me real quick to 1 Kings. Second Kings, Second Kings chapter six. This just came to my mind. I'm going to read it out. Second Kings chapter six, verse fifteen. This is with Elisha. It says, "Now when the attendant of the man of God had risen early and gone out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was circling the city. And his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? Have you ever been in a place where you just feel like you're in over your head?" Have you ever felt like you're in a place where you're about to be overcome? Overcome with fear? Overcome with doubt? This servant was in that place. He sees the army. And yet, Elisha answers back and says, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Then Elisha prayed and said, O oh Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Beloved, I want you to understand this. You and I are never alone. The Word of God says that He has appointed angels to watch over you, to keep watch over you. There is something so incredible that we can't see, but that we are called to live in. Because He says, you have arrived at Mount Zion. It's a thin veil we can't see, but we're living in that reality. Beloved, when we're worshiping God, do you not think that there are angels in our midst that are worshiping along with us? God's warriors who are fighting for us and ministering to us. And so he says in this word, he says, you know what? Myriads of angels in the city of God where you have come. He also goes on to say, To the general assembly and church of the firstborn, who are enrolled in heaven. Who are enrolled in heaven. Beloved, that's us. Now, now, where are we in the city of God? What's our standing in the city of God, beloved? I want you to go with me real quick to Ephesians. I'm sorry, to Revelation. To Revelation chapter 3, verse 5. Revelation 3 verse 5 says this, He who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments. And I will not erase his name from the book of life. And I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Here is something so incredible, beloved. As we've arrived at Mount Zion, we have a Father in heaven who is announcing our name to the angels. It says, to the one who has overcome. That's a key. To the one who has overcome, not the one who has started out, but the one who has finished well, to the one who has overcome, I will not erase his name from the book of life. I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Jump with me now to Ephesians. Ephesians 2, 4, 6. What is our standing in Mount Zion? What is our standing in the city of God? What is our standing in the new Jerusalem? Beloved, hear me, because I, I got the same response, I think, from the 830 service. I think this is a, a spiritual warfare, because I believe that this truth in Ephesians 2, 4, and 6, it's hard for us to grasp, but it's true. What is our standing in Christ Jesus? Ephesians 2, 4 through 6 says this, But God, being rich in mercy, because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, he made us alive together with Christ and raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Beloved, listen to this. It says, made us alive together with Christ. When we know Christ Jesus, we have been raised. We've enjoyed resurrection. There is a truth here right now that we're walking in resurrection as we sit here. Not only have we enjoyed the resurrection, 
but it says, and raised us up with him. We've also taken part in his ascension. That in Christ Jesus, you and I, in our spirit, we have taken part in Christ's ascension. There is a union with Christ where we encounter, encounter his ascension. Now when he ascended to heaven, where does he sit? He sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. Now get this. He raised us up with him and he has seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Okay, you're sitting in your red chair, but where are you also sitting? You're sitting with Him in the heavenly places. Where is Christ sitting? He's sitting at the right hand of God the Father. It's that place of authority. It's that place of power. When Jesus Christ said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth, we're sitting next to Him. Are we walking in that authority today? See, beloved, I believe that many times we're having a hard time even receiving this word because all we count on is our senses. We're like Israel. that They, they see the mountain. They hear the trumpets. They feel the, the, the ground quaking. And then they tremble because they're reacting to what they see. But God says to his people today, I don't want you to react to what you see with your physical eyes. I want you to start walking with spiritual eyes and start reacting with spiritual eyes. Start reacting to what is the truth that God is speaking over you and me. Because that, beloved, is how we overcome our hardships. That's how we overcome trials. It's not where God is wanting us to live in a delusional world. It's where God wants us to walk in reality. And the reality is, you have come to Mount Zion. The reality is that you and I, in Christ Jesus, we sit with Him. Is Christ sitting on a throne? Do we have thrones? Or do we just get little stools? See, this is the thing, beloved. I believe that if we start understanding this word, we start walking differently. We start handling problems and issues very differently. We don't understand authority. We don't understand our place. We don't understand our position in Christ. And because we don't understand that, we live as though we don't have anything, but we've been forgiven. But we struggle and we, we try and we have trials and we just don't know what to do with it. Go with me to Matthew 18. Matthew 18, verse 18. Jesus speaking, and he says, Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. Why is that? It's because we are already in Mount Zion. We are already seated next to Christ. We already have the Holy Spirit. And so the things that Christ is binding on earth, we're just participating with him. And so, beloved, when you are struggling with fear, when you're struggling with fear in your life, Christ knows that, and He starts binding that. But He's also asking you to participate in that. And He says, bind it. Bind that fear in Christ Jesus. If, if you have doubt, Christ recognizes and sees that doubt, and He's binding that doubt, but He's asking you to participate. And so trust Him, and begin binding the doubt in your life. Beloved, I remember I went through a, a, a situation not too long ago, maybe about three, three years ago, three or four years ago. I was waking up in the middle of the night fearful. And it wasn't just one night, it was several nights. I, and I couldn't really get a hold of it because I've had, I've gone through spiritual warfare, but I was waking up and I didn't know what to do with the kind of fear. And I began to wake Candy up and say, God, I don't understand this. But my tendency at first was not to pray. My tendency at first was to even become more fearful and become more anxious and try to, try to reason through what I was going through. 
Praise God for my wife. She said, Lonnie, bind it. Let's praise God. And we began to praise God. We began to bind those things. And what happened? It stopped happening in my life. I can't explain why I went through that today, but it was, a, it was a time of testing, I believe, and where the Lord was actually trying to teach me how to walk in the authority in Christ Jesus. But many times, beloved, our prayers don't take that on. We don't understand that kind of walk. And the Lord says, you have that kind of authority because where you are seated right now. Right now. Now, when you and I breathe our last breath, that thin veil will be removed. And that's where the Lord is saying, this is what we see, this is what we will behold. We will see the myriads of angels. We'll see the church. We'll recognize our, our place where, it, where it's always been. But the Lord doesn't want us to wait then. He, it's a now word for us, beloved. We have come to Mount Zion. Go with me back to Hebrews. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn who are enrolled into heaven, and to God the judge of all. Now, now that's something I believe, I believe, beloved, why we don't get this many times is because this is the part that we want to try to to pass up. How many of y'all really like to see or to focus or to meditate upon God as the judge? No hands. Come on. How about Christ as the shepherd? Okay, there we go. There we go. How about, how about God the Father? Okay, there we go. But God the judge? And yet, the, the truth is, God says, focus on this. My people Israel understood, and they shook. But many times in the 21st century, we don't shake because we just try to dismiss. We, we try to set it aside. We, we want to focus on Jesus with the, with the lamb over his shoulders. We want to focus on the Jesus that we see in pictures. But this God who sits as the judge, uh, we want that God to stay on Mount Sinai, but not to be in Mount Zion. And yet he's there. You know, when, when I was in college, um, this is a kind of a small confession, but when I was in college, I, I had what was called a, a, a lead foot. I don't know if y'all ever had a lead foot, but it's when the, the, the foot just keeps pressing down on the accelerator. You can't quite let off. I had a lot of speeding tickets. And so after a while, I was told that I had to appear before the court. I'd never done that before. When I got caught, I would just pay the fine. But this time, I was like, go to the court, and you have to pay. And I remember, still today, at eight, in my 20s, having to appear before that judge. And they all t they told me, okay, you're going to be up next, and you you're gonna be, you your name is going to be called out. You're going to be told what your offense is. And the judge is going to say, guilty or not guilty. I'm like, okay. And it was like this. There was a lectern just like this. I remember just standing up there. And it was, a, it was a woman judge, and she said, Lonnie Phillips, yes. You have been caught for speeding in, in such and such place, guilty or not guilty. Guilty. I remember how small I felt then. I felt so small just to be able to appear before a judge and say, you know what? I didn't, I didn't keep the law when it came to the traffic. And yet, beloved, this talks about the judge, the moral lawgiver who we appear before. And he sees our thoughts. He knows our emotions. He knows everything about us. And what scares us to death is for him to pass judgment on us. That's why we want to bypass him. But here it is. The people of Israel said, we can't hear this word anymore because they were under the law. But the next phrase, it says this, beloved. The next passage says, And to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, 
And Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. Jesus is the one who stands in between. So no longer are we at Mount Sinai, where we have to fear, where we say we don't want to hear the word of God, but we have a mediator who stands in between and says, Father, I have paid their penalty. And it's paid in full. I remember hearing this. I can't remember who it was from, but I remember uh, someone saying that, you know what, when he stands before the Father as our mediator, he stands with the wounds in his hands. And those wounds in his hands symbolize every sin that I have committed with my hands. The sins that I have committed with my hands, he has bled for. He has died for. As he stands before the Father as the mediator, he has wounds in his feet, and he says, paid in full. And it's those sins that I have committed by going to where darkness has led me. And the mediator is saying, I have paid for that, Father. And he has taken on the crown of thorns on his head. It symbolizes those sins that I have committed that no one else sees. The fantasies that I've thought up. The revenge that I've made up in my mind over someone who has hurt me and the Lord says I see that it's paid in full Jesus is our mediator the thing is what the Lord is trying to to bring into the people of God in Hebrews is hope because the people of God in Hebrews were suffering they were being persecuted they were having hardships and trials and God wanted them to know that there is one that they are walking in this earth, but they are also in heaven. And they are surrounded by myriads of angels and the assembly and the, and the spirits of the righteous. And that's where you are, beloved. If you will just take this word and allow God to, to minister to you, to give you authority to, to overcome the things that you need to overcome. And yet, hear me, in all of this, as Jesus stands as the mediator, it says this, it says, His blood that was sprinkled for you and me, it speaks better than the blood of Abel. What does that mean, that it speaks better than the blood of Abel? The blood of Abel, in, in Hebrews 11, it talks about the blood of Abel still speaking. It says in verse 4, By faith Abel offered up to God a better sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous. God testifying about his gifts. And through faith, though, he is dead, he still speaks. And yet, in this next chapter, it says the sprinkled blood of Christ speaks better than Abel. I love what, what Warren Wiersbe had to say about this. He says this, Abel's blood spoke from the earth crying out for justice. Christ's blood speaks from heaven and announces mercy for sinners. Abel's blood made Cain feel guilty and drove him away in despair. Christ's blood frees us from the guilt of sin and opens the veil for us to stand confidently before the throne of grace. Beloved, how confident today are you standing? Do you stand confidently before the throne of grace? Do you know what Christ has truly done for you? Or have you gone back to Mount Sinai? Which mountain are you more drawn to today? Do you recognize that you have come to Mount Zion? Or do you still see yourself standing before Mount Sinai under the law, under the yoke, under the burden? Mount Sinai is the place of grace. It's the place of freedom. God says you can walk confidently by the sprinkled blood of Christ. You know, the book of Galatians is all about Christians who have gone back to Mount Sinai. They've gone back to the law. They're struggling. They're feeling judgment. They're feeling condemnation. They don't see. And they don't believe what God says about them in this passage of Hebrews. You have come. That you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God. Do you, do you believe, beloved, that when your eyes open, when you breathe your last, that you're home? Or is it going to be a strange place? See, God says you're already home. So when you open your eyes, you're already there. You know the place well. 
because you know his presence well. Christ the mediator. Mount Zion or Mount Sinai. Which do we choose to believe? Which do we choose this morning? Do we believe this word on what it says about me and my standing today? About you and your standing today? That's the struggle, but that's the place where God wants to give us freedom. Let's pray. Let's pray, beloved. Let's ask God to do a, a work in our life. He, hear me real quick because I, I, I just need to say this. God's glory doesn't diminish. God's glory does not diminish in the age of grace. His glory is just as strong as it was at Mount Sinai. When John the Elder saw God, when John the Elder saw Christ in his resurrected state, it said he fell as a dead man. God's glory does not diminish, beloved. But we have the wonderful mediator. Father in heaven, would you help us, Lord, this morning to, to receive this word, Father. I just sense that, Lord God, for some in here, it's, just a, it's tough, God. Our, our eyes, Father, so often are on the, the trials of this life the sufferings that we're, we're encountering. And it's hard for us to truly believe that we've already come to Mount Zion, Lord. We, do, we don't see Mount Zion, Lord God. Yet, Holy Spirit, you who speak truth into our innermost being, you who are able to, to displace distractions and doubts and lies that have been given by the enemy, Father, I pray that those lies would be exposed and that we would truly be able to receive and to walk in this truth this morning. Lord, praise your holy name that we have come to Mount Zion. Praise your holy name that we are in the city of God in the new Jerusalem. We receive this word, Almighty God. Help us, Lord God, to, to now walk in it and to recognize that, Jesus, we have authority to walk in. Thank you for being our mediator, the one whose sprinkled blood is more than enough. Lord, to you be the glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen.